Well, hello everyone, and uh, welcome to tonight's very special event, the Annual Heritage Address, which is actually a concluding event for this year's Open House Melbourne Weekend. Um, for those that may not know me, my name is Fleur Watson, and I'm the Executive Director here at Open House. The Heritage Address is an annual lecture given on all matters relating to our heritage, and it's presented by the Heritage Council of Victoria, and supported by Fed Square, and we're very grateful to them. We're also really delighted that tonight's event is being live streamed, so it's available for everyone to engage with and enjoy wherever you might be in Victoria or Australia, or maybe even across the world. And it's being recorded, so it will be on our website uh, for you to look at after the event. Uh, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the lands of which we gather tonight. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, as well as to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the wider Nam Melbourne community and beyond those watching via the live stream. Indigenous sovereignty has never been ceded in Australia and at Open House Melbourne, we try to be very mindful of this in everything we do, given our focus on the modern built environment. Well, what an uh, incredibly stimulating and diverse Open House Melbourne weekend it has been. It's our 15th year of Open House Melbourne, um, and of course, our return to physical programming after two years of, of virtual weekends through the pandemic. And it's just been so incredibly um, rewarding and extraordinary to be moving around the city and the suburbs over the weekend and seeing people engaging with, with all of that's been on offer. We've actually had 200 plus tours, exhibitions, workshops, a distributed exhibition. So I'm really delighted with the diversity um, of, from all the contributors, many of you who are no doubt with us here tonight or watching, uh, and we're really grateful for that support. This year's theme has been Built Unbuilt, and it feels particularly apt for this discussion uh, tonight and Katrina's address. Um, Built Unbuilt really seeks to catalyse a city-wide conversation about the future of architecture, landscape and urban design through some of the pressing issues that we face today. How the built environment contributes to and shapes public life. Our relationship between the built and the natural world. And really importantly, and our exhibition this year really tried to tackle this and grapple with these ideas, 
how to reveal, reconcile and acknowledge the prehistories and afterlives of places, spaces and buildings. Built Unbuilt celebrates the contribution and the impact of good design in our built environment, and yet it also explored the city at diverse scales and systems. The urban, the civic, the public, landscape, interior, as well as those spaces that are unbuilt, those in-between spaces, the porous, the interconnected. So, as I mentioned, tonight's program and this theme of Built Unbuilt culminates tonight with this very special address by Katrina Sedgwick. And I'm going to hand over now to the Heritage Council uh, Chair and Melbourne University Professor Philip Goad, who will introduce Katrina more fully. Um, and I'd like to just give you a little short bio on uh, Professor Goad himself. Philip Goad is the Chair of Architecture, the Redmond Barry Distinguished Professor and Co-Director of the Australian Centre for Architectural History, Urban and Cultural Heritage at the University of Melbourne. He is internationally known for his research and he is an authority on modern Australian architecture. In 2019 and 2020, he was the Gough Whitlam Malcolm Fraser Chair of Australian Studies at Harvard University and he is the current chair of the Heritage Council of Victoria. Thank you, Philip. Thank you very much, Fleur. So, welcome to the 2022 Open House Heritage Address. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, in the spirit of reconciliation, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. I wish to acknowledge that this event takes place on what always was and always will be the lands of the people of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. The 2022 Heritage Address is delivered in a partnership with the Heritage Council of Victoria. The Heritage Council has been a proud supporting partner of Open House Melbourne since its inception in 2008, with each year's address given, being given by prominent individuals representing a, and presenting a reflection from a personal and professional perspective on matters relating to our heritage. The Heritage Council is an independent statutory body which recognises, protects and celebrates Victoria's cultural heritage. The Council advises the government and others on how to conserve and protect historically important objects and places for the enjoyment of current and future generations. And now tonight's speaker, newly appointed CEO of the Melbourne Arts Precinct Corporation Katrina Sedgwick. From 2002 to 2012, Katrina was the founding director and CEO of the Adelaide Film Festival, becoming head of arts for the Australian Broadcasting Corporation in 2012. After nearly three years with the ABC, Katrina moved to become the director CEO of ACME, the Australian Centre for the Moving Image. And during this time, Katrina sat on the board of directors for the Australian Film, Television and Radio School. She was an advisory committee member for the Grimwade Centre for Cultural Materials Conservation at the University of Melbourne. And she also acted as chair for the Back to Back Theatre. Tonight, Katrina will reflect on her experience as a leader in shaping Melbourne's cultural landscape and on the concept of future heritage. Katrina's address will then be followed by a conversation facilitated by Stuart Harrison, architect and Open House Melbourne board president. I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to come together this evening and listen to this year's heritage, heritage address. And so please make welcome our speaker this evening, Katrina Sedgwick. Thank you very much. 
Um, I too would like to acknowledge that we meet here today on the lands of the Wurundjeri people and pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, I've been asked, as uh, Philip and Fleur have said, uh, to reflect today on future heritage in the context of the open house theme of Built Unbuilt. And through the prism of my work in the cultural and arts sector uh, over the past 35 years, um, but most particularly recently uh, for the last seven and a half years here in Melbourne. And before I start, I do want to thank Vanessa Walker, who's here tonight, for the fantastic work she's done in helping me bring this speech together tonight. Um, Hannah Louis, who's professor in the Faculty of Law Architect, sorry, Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning at, at University of Melbourne, says that heritage can be defined as what we do with history in the present. As custodians for future generations, it's not counterintuitive to think of heritage as just as tied to the present and the future as it is to the past. I was speaking earlier this week to Elaine Gurian, who's been my mentor for the past five years or so. She's now 84 years of age and a truly wonderful person, and she's a guru of the museum sector. Based in the United States, she's led and enabled physical and philosophical change in museums across the world, ranging from the Boston Children's Museum to the Smithsonian's National Museum of African and American History and Culture in Washington, DC, to Te Papa in Wellington, and over the last 10 years, she's been working on a major new museum that was meant to be built in Kyiv, in Ukraine. Tragically, now that's impossible with the Russian invasion and the active targeting of cultural sites across that nation. I asked Elaine last week how she defined heritage and future heritage, and without hesitation, she said it's about justice, about equity and access and that the only difference between past and future heritage are the tools and technology available to access or preserve it, but its purpose, who it is for, remains the same. And that is that it is for us all, because our identity and our soul live within our heritage. So in this place and in this land, we live within an extraordinary heritage that First Nations people have created and preserved for over 60,000 years. And I want to acknowledge that we're here today on the banks of Birrarung, the Yarra River, on the unceded land of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation. Here in Australia, we must acknowledge this heritage as we build on this land and respect and illuminate their heritage, past, present and future, with traditional custodians and with all First Nations people. And I also want to acknowledge the passing of Gunditjmara Bunjalung, senior elder, song, ma song man, truth teller and storyteller, Archie Roach, um, who passed away yesterday, and acknowledge the legacy that he has left behind him. Um, he was here many times at Federation Square over the last 20 years, um, but perhaps most powerfully, when he performed Took the Children Away on the 13th of February 2008, after the then Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, delivered a national apology to the Stolen Generations. Vail Archie Roach. So, I grew up in Adelaide on Ghana land, at a time when future heritage was front and centre of the Premier of South Australia's strategy for the state. Don Dunstan had a vision that placed the arts at the centre of his government's agenda, building on the small capital city's deep passion for the arts. The first arts festival in Australia, the Adelaide Festival of Arts, was born out of a lively local culture of theatre and music and catalyzed into existence by its community. Taking inspiration from the Edinburgh Festival, the idea was first floated in 1958 by former newspaper journalist and editor Lloyd Dumas and John Bishop, professor of music at the University of Adelaide. They shared the concept at a meeting at the Adelaide Club and it was from that first meeting that the majority of financial backers and the first board of governors was formed. The inaugural Adelaide Festival of Arts was held in 1960 with Bishop as its artistic director. In the late 1960s, the city of Adelaide and the state government joined forces to develop a vision for a new festival hall that would put Adelaide, along with its fledgling festival, on the global arts map. They launched a public appeal for funds, which attracted enormous support from the Adelaide community, raising its target in less than a week. 
In fact, it was oversubscribed, and the surplus was used to purchase an exceptional art collection for the centre. The Dunstan government began funding the festival and its fringe in the 1970s, and then they expanded the vision of Festival Hall into the Adelaide Festival Centre. Opened by Gough Whitlam in 1973, its striking architecture by John Morfitt and Colin Hassel, founder of the international firm currently de um, designing uh, the Melbourne Arts Precinct's public realm. And it included an even more striking plaza, an environmental sculpture that was billed at the time as the largest artwork in Australia. The artist, Otto, Otto Herbert Hayek, described it as a walk-in sculpture at an attempt to reunify the city. The plaza was part of a cohesive landscape, a kind of precinct. Indeed, the festival centre was the first of its kind in Australia, a cultural precinct including multiple buildings with specific cultural uses. And the festival centre precinct has many parallels to Fed Square 30 years later. The festival centre was a game changer for Adelaide. By the time I was in high school, the festivals in March had blossomed and grown to be recognised world over. And they were proudly owned by the whole city. It had become part of the identity of Adelaide and the state as a whole, part of our DNA. Even the number plates on our cars proclaimed we were the festival state. This is a picture of me performing in the 1986 Adelaide Festival with Etc. Theatre, um, straight out of school, appropriately here standing on the columns at the front of Parliament House where Don Johnston developed so much of his wonderful policy. It's a wonderful heritage building that dominates the main intersection of the city. Later, I was a producer on Robin Archer's 98 and 2000 festivals, and we worked with a wide range of community and cultural organisations right across the state. Not once did I get a no when I asked the many thousands of people to be involved. This collective community ownership of this element of the state's heritage was powerful, and it shaped investment and preservation in the city from then on. The point I'm making here is that the events grew out of the community, and then the government literally built on this momentum with bold and visionary investment that took the state and the festival to another level and a rich heritage was born for the state, both in physical infrastructure and cultural activity. I moved to Melbourne seven and a half years ago to head up ACME. After growing up in Adelaide and spending much of my adult life in Sydney, it's been a wonderful experience to move here, to a city and state with a leadership and a community that understand that creativity and culture and ideas are at the centre of its identity and its economy and it's deeply embedded in its heritage. Victoria is the envy of the nation with its visionary creative industry policies, which have supported the government's strategic investment in built cultural infrastructure for many years. It's a place that revels in art and design, as we've seen this weekend, Fleur, um, in ideas and debate and conversation. It's no accident that Melbourne is the home to the most visited gallery, museum and library in the nation. And ACME has no precise equivalent anywhere in the world, but it too is one of the most visited museums in the country. As I moved into the museum sector, I was struck how my experience in festivals was so applicable to the museum environment. Festivals offer a critical mass of programming in a focused time and place, offering multiple points of entry, multiple ways to participate and to contribute, inviting and enabling people to come together to participate in and share cultural and creative activity, inspiration and conversation. Museum programs ideally do this year round, but they also hold a critical, sorry, host a critical mass of cultural activity in a different form in their collections. And this again is our heritage, the hordes of objects and stories that have been selected over many years by many people for preservation and presentation and to pass on to future generations. Many of the buildings here in Melbourne are, that are home to wonderful cultural institutions were designed to not only exhibit, uh, share, create and present the arts, but also to house and care for them through their collections and preservation activities. They're each a treasure trove of valuable content and story that belongs to the Victorian people. The built form is not the only thing that is culturally significant. It's the activity within them 
the collections within them, and the social connections to them over time that are just as important, if not more important, than the built fabric. And because these connections are complex and a part of who we are, in the case of precincts, it is not just the buildings, but the spaces between them and the people throughout that are important. In the European tradition, which our older buildings reflect, art was and is displayed for public consumption in grand galleries, theatres and palaces of culture. With their impressive scale, solid walls and tightly controlled programs, these places often presented a daunting edifice, a barrier to people who didn't feel that they were welcome or that their content was relevant to them. These perceived barriers meant that many people never set foot inside them, even though they were intended for them, part of an enlightenment tradition of public education and social development. Over the past few decades, a shift has been occurring. In response to critiques of their colonial practices and other significant demographic and social changes, many of these cultural institutions are reframing their purpose to actively rethink and reshape their cultural programs and embrace more diverse audiences and new, often hybrid forms of practice. In a way, museums are reactivating their civic role as a gathering place where people from right across the community can explore, discover and share diverse perspectives and ideas, their heritage and the heritage of others. The institutions are opening up refocusing their resources to invite in diverse audiences and to target groups who they acknowledge have been discouraged in the past. Many of the most popular and inspiring museums are now reinventing themselves in quite radical ways. I'd like to talk a bit about that journey now for ACME. ACME was conceived as an institution at the same time as Fed Square was being planned as a bold new type of museum, embracing a new era of screen-based culture. Then Premier Jeff Kennett described it in this way, the Cinemedia Centre will encourage access to Australia's cultural heritage and exhibit the history and highlights of cinema and television in Australia and overseas. ACME is unique in our region, and it tells the story of the past, present, and near future of film, television, video games, digital culture, and art. For people not involved in the fields of digital art and cinema, it may have been a bit of a mystery at first hearing, until they got into the exhibitions which have been popular from the outset. But from the beginning, the museum struggled to establish its identity. It was difficult to identify externally at both the Flinders Street and Fed Square entrances. When you got inside, it was unclear what the offer was. What is a museum of the moving image? And the foyer spaces weren't inviting for patrons to dwell and spend time together before and after they'd explored the exhibitions or seen a film. The very vertical nature of the museum, which is spread across four floors, made it difficult to read as a single institution. People could see an, ex could see an exhibition and not understand that there were cinemas upstairs and vice versa. And our collection activities were invisible to the public, hidden across the square in the basement of the Yarra building. The ACME renewal, made possible by the support of the government uh, of Victoria and many generous partners and donors, gave us the opportunity to improve the visitor experience and through this ensure that our audience reflected the diversity of our community. As we embarked on the renewal, we undertook three crucial consultations. Firstly, we met with 25 of Australia's leading First Nations screen practitioners in a meeting that was facilitated by the Indigenous Department of Screen Australia. We asked them how they would like to see First Nations stories and practitioners represented in Australia's National Museum of Screen Culture. Their most crucial feedback was that the museum must reflect the fact that stories have been told using shadow and light in this place, across this nation, by First Nations people for over 60,000 years. Shadow and light are the building blocks of film and highlighting and celebrating this extraordinary continuum would be crucial to the successful renewal of the, of the museum. ACME's First Nation curators and Indigenous advisory group led this work, including with the support of the Maya Foundation, commissioning Gudachamara artist Vicky Cousins to create a multi-part site-specific installation entitled Yanmiya that opens and closes the free permanent exhibition. Work. 
My name's Vicky Cousins and I'm a Kire Warong Gunditjmara woman from the Western Districts of Victoria. The name of the work is Yanmiar and it means flickering in the firelight. The whole work is about where does moving image originate from with shadows and light. And it comprises a 300 kilo acrylic lens suspended from the ceiling with figures who were set out in a formation in corroboree in ceremony, giving people the opportunity to perhaps see the world through our lens. Architect BKK's multi-award winning design created warm and inviting public spaces and connected the four levels of the museum with a central staircase that built on Lab's original vision for Fed Square, celebrating the laneway, connecting the city through to the river and encouraging visitors to explore and to dwell. As we're about to start the construction, Federation Square was listed as heritage building. It was critical that we worked closely with Heritage Victoria and heritage specialist Lovell Chen to ensure that our changes achieved the evolving ambition for the building whilst preserving its key original features and intentions. And as we sought to understand barriers and opportunities for the visitor, we worked with MELD Studios to map the visitor journey. This careful research helped us to understand the hurdles and the barriers, perceived and real, that prevented visitors from cross crossing our threshold, both physical and digital, and ensure we had user experience design at the forefront of our thinking throughout. Through my time at ACME, based here in Federation Square, and particularly through the renewal experience, I was constantly reminded of the importance of the threshold between the museum and the surrounding public realm, in particular, the Civic Square, and the synergies and possibilities that arise when art and its audiences merge with the broader life of the city. And of course, this is an essential part of the vision of the Melbourne Arts Precinct Transformation, or MAPT. Um, but before we go there, let's consider the built and unbuilt heritage of Federation Square itself. Federation Square's origin story goes a long way back. On the high bank of the plentiful Birrarung, this place had long been a gathering for the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people and visiting Kulin nations. But it was built over and turned into train yards, a morgue, a fish market, and a few other unsightly structures as the city and town grew. And in the meantime, Melbourne's planners had aspired for a central civic square in the heart of the city. But it wasn't until the turn of the 21st century that an ideal occasion for the dream to be realised presented itself. Intended to commemorate 100 years of Federation, Federation Square was the culmination of years of strategising by the people and the city of Melbourne and the Victorian government to create a gateway to the city and reflect Melbourne's forward-looking culture of creativity, innovation and cultural diversity. Federation Square's Civic and Cultural Charter was developed during the competition phase as a guide to its development and its operations with its anchor cultural tenants being ACME and the Ian Ponta Centre, NGV Australia, now of course joined by the Koori Heritage Trust. The vision for the precinct also included supporting retail and hospitality in the mix, with the clear qualification that these commercial uses would play second fiddle to the primary civic and cultural purpose of the precinct. The competition winning design by Bates Smart and Lab Architecture was a contemporary vision of the city. Unlike the city grid, but drawing on the pedestrian delights of the city, its arca arcades and its laneways, and deliberately creating new flows of circulation into the square and across the precinct to the river. The architecture also expressed the idea of a federated system Connected, cohesive buildings formed around a central civic plaza with its inscribed artwork, Near Am New, depicting various voices of a multicultural community. As well as creating new and interesting public spaces of different scales, Fed Square's unorthodox geometry presented a distinctive image of the city, especially in its aerial view and in the unique pattern language of its facades, a language that has since been appropriated in many ways as Brand Melbourne. And this year, Federation Square has its 20th anniversary. 
There have been many thousands of events that have embedded Fed Square in our collective consciousness as a special shared place, a part of our identity. New Year's Eve celebrations, of course. The protest against the war in Iraq in 2003. The apology. Tanderum. The enactment in the square of Tanderum, a cultural ceremony bringing together the five language groups of the East Kulin Nation, was held at the beginning of the Melbourne Festival for several years, a living and public celebration of the deep cultural connection our traditional custodians have with this place, and an event in which all of Melbourne's citizens and visitors could take part. In Graham Davison's words, Federation Square is already an important part of Melbourne's history, not just as a monument to the centenary of the nation, or for the symbols of civic and national identity it incorporates, but as the legacy of a long tradition. Going back to the ancient Greeks and reinforced by generations of Melburnians who fought for a square, it's a tradition that puts civic values and virtues, our responsibility to our fellow citizens at the heart of our collective life. Only a few years ago, we heard very clearly how much people valued Federation Square when they spontaneously spoke out against the Apple Store proposal. That proposal triggered an outpouring of public sentiment about what people loved about Federation Square. People spoke to their personal connections to the place and their enjoyment of being together in a public space. These emotional connections are important and deep. They talked about how important it was that this space remain open and civic as a communal space for everyone, free of private or commercial influences. Maintaining its symbolic and architectural character was seen as fundamentally important, and the public called for its heritage listing. In over 700 submissions during the consultation period, there were only three objections, and overwhelmingly there was support for the importance of the founding civic and cultural charter. Fed Square's heritage is now protected as a whole precinct for its civic, cultural, social, historical, technological and aesthetic significance. Melbourne Arts Precinct is part of a generation of cultural precincts that popped up in many post-industrial cities in the mid-20th century. These projects made symbolic statements about the city's cultural heritage and status and formed part of a, a broader inner urban revitalisation plans, many of them in former industrial waterfront areas that had previously functioned for decades as the city's industrial sewers. Many of these precincts were designed as a cluster of sculptural buildings with tenuous pedestrian links between them, based on the premise of visitors arriving by car via underground car parks. South Back in London was an early example Lincoln Centre in New York, Brisbane's own South Bank, the Adelaide Festival Centre, and our own early arts institutions envisaged through Roy Ground's master plan. All of them were ambitious, brutalist visions of a modern, future-facing city, providing fit-for-purpose venues for the various art forms, music and theatre and visual arts, with capacity to accommodate new modes of practice and presentation and different audience sizes, a one-stop shop for the arts. The style of brutalist architecture, which many of us have grown to love, later came under fire as a symbolic and physical shutting out of less privileged parts of the community. And this is something that many of these same precincts are now addressing head on as they revitalise their precincts. The Melbourne Arts Precinct Transformation is an opportunity to connect our beloved but somewhat disconnected arts precinct and will open it up to enable a new era of engagement with and ex exploration of the rich cultural collections and activity. It is truly a city changing project that will connect the back doors of NGR, NGVI and Arts Centre Melbourne to the rest of the precinct. And furthermore, will welcome a dazzling new member into the neighbourhood, the Fox NGV Contemporary. But the Melbourne Arts Precinct didn't just appear in the 1950s. We know that this area, near where saltwater meets freshwater, has been an important place for gathering and living for Wurundjeri, Bunurong, and visiting Kulin nations for millennia. And they still have ongoing connections to this place, despite the traumas of invasion and waves of development over the last nearly two centuries. Situated 
actually going to go back to this. Situated to the south of Melbourne's central district, the precinct begins right here at Federation Square and connects across the Prince's Bridge, moving into South Bank, past and around Hamer Hall, the Arts Centre and NGV International, down to South Bank Boulevard and through Sturt Street and Dodd Street and Grant Street. Melbourne's Arts Precinct is unusual in the density and diversity of cultural institutions around our gallery and theatres. And this really began with the VCA. The subsequent development of South Bank behind St Kilda Road enabled nearby existing industrial buildings to be readily converted to arts and cultural uses, enabling established and emerging organisations to co-locate with their bigger institutional siblings. The precinct also goes east into the gardens and west through Kavanagh Street and City Road and along the southern bank of the river into South Bank, one of Melbourne's fastest growing inner city suburbs. According to the census, South Bank's population has doubled in the past decade and its population is young, with two thirds of residents aged in their 20s or 30s. The suburb's diversity is enormous, with only one third of residents born here in Australia and the remaining largely born in India, China, Colombia, Malaysia and England. Nearly half of South Bank residents walk to work. It is a perambulatory suburb where people move between buildings. The immediate suburb as a whole is ripe for animation and activation of its street life through connection and cultural exchange. Our arts precinct has developed organically over time, out of our community with crucial strategic government investments at critical moments to house an ecology of creativity that spans learning, making, creating, presenting, collecting and preserving. The landscape of the area we now call South Bank, where the first civic bridge crossed the river, has been utterly transformed. From the earliest white settlement, the south side became the main gateway to the town for immigrants, for gold seekers and for visiting dignitaries arriving from the port. Once a lightly treed, low-lying expanse of meadows full of lagoons and animals cultivated by Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung and Boonwurrung, it has been excavated, drained, filled, built and rebuilt many times for industrial, military and residential purposes, quite different from the more contained activity on the northern edge of the carefully planned city grid. Alongside this backdrop of mixed and messy activity, there's been a constant thread of recreation and entertainment, and it's long been an important axis of civic and ceremonial activity as a gateway into the city. Circuses were a mainstay in the area for nearly a century. They took up residency in the swampy area from as early as the 1860s, with Worth Brothers Circus becoming a permanent fixture from 1906 for nearly 50 years in what became Worth Gardens. There were agricultural shows on the acres behind the Circus and St Kilda Road military barracks in the 1870s and the 1880s before they moved to Flemington showgrounds. After the exuberant celebration of the new Princess Bridge opening and Victoria's separation from New South Wales in 1851, the Gateway site saw many ceremonial occasions. For the Federation celebrations in 1901, when Federal Parliament was opened by the Duke of York, he and the Duchess were driven ceremoniously from Government House in the Domain along St Kilda Road and across the bridge, flanked by crowds, past the site that would become Federation Square a century later. Preparations for the Federation event had started a few years earlier with the land at the South Bank site, formerly reserved for public purposes. The Prince's Court Fun Fair then sprung up with a water chute, a Japanese tea house, a dance hall, and thrillingly, a glossarium ice skating rink where punters skated to live orchestral music. It sounds fantastic. The Snowdon Gardens, similar to the gardens on the east side of St Kilda Road today, were built in 1903, and for a time from 1916, housed the Playhouse Theatre and Melbourne Repertory Theatre Company. And I like those circular pavilions, which seem to anticipate Hamer Hall to come. In 1942, as World War II impacted the globe, the Victorian government began thinking of the future heritage of Melbourne's library, gallery and museum, then all housed in what is now our magnificent, heritage-listed and recently refurbished State Library of Victoria. 
They began a shift to more sophisticated arts and cultural developments, heeding calls from the community to build a dedicated art gallery and arts centre for Melbourne. In 1943, it was recommended that the National Gallery of Victoria be established on the Worth Brothers site, along with a theatre to hold 1,000 people, which became Arts Centre Melbourne. Over the next 15 years, through several changes of government, the land was secured. Um, I love this sign. I'm sure that chairmen everywhere are wanting to get cheques sent directly to them as they fundraise. Um, so as that was happening over that 15 years, of course, uh, the wonderful Maya Music Bowl was being built, designed by architects Yunkin, Freeman Brothers and Griffin and Simpson, Griffiths and Simpson, apologies, opened in 1959 with 30,000 people in attendance. This is a Christmas carols event soon after that in 1960. Roy Ground's wonderful master plan for the new precinct was approved in December 1960 and work began immediately on the new National Gallery of Victoria building. It was completed in 1968 and was immediately embraced by the people of Melbourne with its great hall and magnificent arched water wall entrance. I'm not sure if you can see here, but this is a shot from their opening event back on the 20th of August in 1968. It's really interesting. I think this is a very early interactive installation. It's so inviting and engaging and now so Instagrammable. Um, the building was then heritage listed only 14 years later. Construction began on Arts Centre Melbourne at the Concert Hall in 1973 with John Truscott designing the interiors, the Melbourne Concert Hall, now Hamer Hall, opening in 1982 and the Theatres Building in 1984 with its iconic spire. And again, these wonderful buildings and their interiors were quickly heritage listed and they were from the outset widely used by the people of Victoria and the visitors to our state. I really like this. Uh, picture. It's an image that the University of Melbourne, the VCA team, tweeted not so recently. And you can see the grounds buildings from above showing their wonderful geometry um, along here. And hopefully you can build, uh, pick out a whole lot of very special buildings right across the precinct. Um, you can see one of the reasons they've tweeted this, obviously, is that you can see all of the, the sort of VCA campus towards the the left, which sort of spills out and spreads increasingly uh, across the precinct. Since the 1973 opening of the VCA, the site has been no stranger to transformation. It was situated there in close proximity to the NGV for the benefit of the students. And this was the first major move in the development of a more holistic arts precinct ecology, bringing education alongside the major cultural institutions. Now the South, South Bank campus of the University of Melbourne, the VCA's buildings reflect South Bank's diverse historical past, initially repurposing the Victoria's police depot, a postal workshop, and a radio manufacturing warehouse to house its cohort. After bringing tertiary students into the precinct, the VCA then established its secondary school in 1978. And then the Primrose Potter Australian Ballet Centre opened in 1988, which also, along with housing the company's administration, has the Australian Ballet School. In 1990, Playbox Theatre, now Malt House, moved into the old CUB Malt House in Sturt Street, repurposing the old brick brewing building for their contemporary needs. And in 2002, Acker, relocating from the domain, moved in next door into a bold, purpose-built gallery by Woods Marsh, along with Chunky Move. The spaces between these buildings have been activated more and more as time has gone by. The Melbourne Recital Centre and the MTC's South Bank Theatre opened their stunning purpose-built buildings in 2009, and the recent greening along South Bank Boulevard by the City of Melbourne has made the public street spaces outside these buildings more welcome and social for their visitors and for residents and workers in the suburb. The VCA continued repurposing buildings in the precinct, expanding into Dodd Street warehouses and the old police hospital on South Bank Boulevard in 2015. They commissioned the stunning 2018 conversion of the former Mountain Branch police staples by Kirsten Thompson. Home to the Victoria Police Horses and Riding School since 1912, 
it now houses dozens of studios and exhibition and performance spaces for the VCA students. And in the same year, Buxton Contemporary opened through the generous gift from Michael Buxton. In 2019, the Melbourne Conservatorium of Music was built and with it a series of laneways cutting through the university precinct, ready for activation. The heritage of Queen Victoria Gardens on St Kilda Road, home to John Truscott's stunning glass pavilions on, in Spoleto festivals, now house the magnificent M Pavilion commissions each year. And the creativity and activation is expanding as we reimagine and reuse our heritage buildings and gardens and spaces between, as we saw so excitingly with Rising's takeover of the Maya Music Bowl for the Wilds. So our challenge is to leverage this living heritage and the extraordinary collective energy that is there. The 2014 Melbourne Arts Precinct Blueprint, funded by all three tiers of government, set out an ambitious plan to harness the potential to be a vibrant, active place, to be a tourism destination, a cultural mecca, and an exciting place to live, work, and play. The Victorian government's $1.7 billion Melbourne Arts Precinct Transformation Project will connect this rich heritage of our past with the potential for the future. It's another game-changing moment that builds on the rich assets handed down from previous generations and supports a bold contemporary vision transforming the city and its communities. MAPCO, which I now lead, has been established to support this, and I see that we've got three key areas of focus. To deliver with our project partners, the NGV, Arts Centre Melbourne, Development Victoria and Creative Victoria, this extraordinary capital project. We've also taken over the management of the operations of Federation Square, and once the capital works are complete, we're gonna manage and operate the new public realm. And we also need to ensure that throughout, we're working with our partners across the precinct, the city and the state, holistically and strategically and collaboratively, to ensure that this investment is fully leveraged to connect the precinct and enhance the suburb for residents, workers, businesses, as well as our visitors, to deliver a whole that is larger than the sum of our parts. It's about creating future heritage by investing in our present. So, what is mapped? After nearly 40 years of hard work, Art Centre Melbourne is getting a major rejuvenation. Designed by NH Architects, the transformation includes critical upgrades to bring this wonderful heritage building into the 21st century with a particular focus on the State Theatre, Melbourne's purpose-built home for the Australian Ballet and Opera Australia and many other visiting and local companies replacing its fly tower, improving its technical and broadcast capacity, its acoustics, its lighting, its auditorium, including greater access for mobility impaired patrons. We're upgrading its backstage areas with new rehearsal studios, green rooms, stage door, and doubling its truck load, loading capacity. And new restaurants will spill out onto the public realm on the northern and western sides of the building. The new Fox NGV Contemporary is being designed by competition winners Angelo Candelapas and Associates. And the image you are seeing are from the competition. It's going through the next stage of design right now and we'll be sharing that soon. It's building on the unmatched success of NGV over the past decade as it's dramatically expanded its impact and reach, doubling its audiences through its triennial, its major exhibitions and its collecting strategies. The NGVC will be a stunning new landmark in the arts precinct and will celebrate the central role of art and design in contemporary life. Complementing Roy Ground's NGVI, the design draws visitors inside through its dramatic arched entries and into a wondrous and uplifting building featuring a more than 40 metre high spherical central hall. NGV Contemporary will have more than 13,000 square metres of dedicated display space and expansive galleries, giving its visitors more and largely free access to the NGV's wonderful collections and exhibitions. An expansive rooftop terrace and sculpture garden will give visitors incredible views across the precinct, seeing the beautiful geometry of the ground, Roy Grounds buildings from above, through to the river and the city, across the parklands, and across the Arts Precinct and South Bank as a whole. The public realm delivers 18,000 square metres of green public space, 
It wraps around Arts Centre Melbourne and connects the NGV NGVI to the new NGVC. It opens up what was previously seen as the back of the precinct and removes the wall around the hugely popular sculpture garden behind NGVI. Designed by Hassel and So Ill, the public realm will be a beautiful space, a garden, inviting people from across our community to stop and dwell and spend time together. And again, these are early images from the design process. Um, Hassel and Sowell are just recommencing uh, schematic design right now. It's gonna be a destination in and of itself for the people of Victoria and our visitors, and it'll be activated by superb design, planting, furniture, and public art interventions, both visual and performative. And it'll become the entry point for the public to discover the stories and heritage inside the institutions. But the public realm also creates a new pedestrian pathway that not only invites and gives access to people into these wonderful institutions, but provides a seamless and safe connection from Princess Bridge and St Kilda Road at Hamer Hall, right through to Southbank Boulevard and down Sturt Street, and to Kavanagh Street, and down to Birrarung, and the River Promenade and Southgate, and to City Road. You can see here on Roy Ground's design sketch where Sturt Street reaches out through the centre of the image. It's, it's amazing how strong that kind of line is, and it's kind of invisible at the moment. Um, since this time, when, when he was imagining this, so many changes have happened. But essentially now, we're going to take those changes and fully extend an elevated green public space across this street, all the way to South, South Bank Boulevard. Through this pedestrian way, we'll be creating a flow through the precinct. Passerbys, passersby, as well as intentional visitors, will be able to move easily and safely day and night. New, view, new views will be possible to and from these impressive and more accessible cultural venues, from their roofs and balconies and into and out of their interior spaces. These new windows into the inner workings of the gallery and the theatres will add new dimensions to the experience of walking through the city. And while there'll be a clear directional flow, it won't be a boring straight line by any means, but a place full of delight with secondary flows and eddies spinning off in different directions and creating spaces and opportunities for sitting, resting, meeting and people watching. This investment and care of the space between these arts institutions means we're not just preaching to the converted, but inviting these pedestrians to share these gardens, their garden, to discover and feel ownership of the public art and installation and performance and through this to feel ownership of and an invitation to the magnificent public institutions they surround. It's a crucial intervention into the urban fabric of this part of the city that can enable a truly connected and vibrant arts precinct as a whole, from Fed Square right down Sturt Street. And if we get it right, we'll be a driver to transform this suburb for residents and businesses alongside the arts organisations. And it will complement the civic heart of Federation Square providing a green street of cultural activity, a place of movement and discovery, complementing Fed Square's warm, vibrant gathering place and its role as a compass to the city. Many other ingredients to ensure the future heritage of the arts precinct are happening in parallel. <clears throat> the City of Melbourne's Green Line renewal along the northern banks of the Yarra and their upgrade of the Riverside Promenade and parks on the southern bank Plus, so many new commercial and residential buildings are being proposed, including Bueller at South Bank on City Road, bringing many more residents and workers to the area. Amendment C330 is a new planning requirement made at the request of Creative Victoria to ensure that the arts precinct can continue to flourish. It requires new developments to encourage the provision of arts and creative industry uses within the first four storeys of buildings, together with the provision of active street frontages and integration with the public realm. I think this is crucial to ensure that small businesses and practitioners can flourish and access affordable spaces and accommodation right across the precinct. I can see the laneways around Kavanagh Street buzzing with cafes and bars. Dodd Street and Grant Street and Sturt Street and the laneways through the university and past Baldhouse and Acker, alive with people moving between ex exhibitions and shows and restaurants, festivals and celebrations taking over the whole area. 
Metro, due to open in a few years, will be transporting thousands of people to the precinct every day, with one of the town hall station stops spilling out directly into the Federation Square forecourt. Rising Festival has reactivated the magnificent interiors of Flinders Street Station with their Patricia Piccinini exhibition, bringing this transport hub into the precinct as well. The Melbourne Arts Precinct will be a living, breathing, creative neighbourhood with diverse and dynamic cultural residents, each with their own role and connected via the commons of the new Arts Avenue. In this address, I've addressed many different heritage, um, built and unbuilt, cultural, social, movable, as well as urban heritage. Over the next few years, this hugely exciting project is going to bring many different people and creative disciplines together, enabling innovation and social interaction in many different ways, building on layers of connection and use for generations of cultural activity in this place. We're going to be thinking holistically, connecting new and old spaces and stories, practitioners and art forms across the precinct, inviting in our community including those who've been traditionally excluded. As we endeavour to respect the heritage of these shared civic, cultural and creative places that have been handed down to us, we're striving through the creation of a civic square and a cultural precinct to make future heritage, places and experiences that future generations will thank us for, that will connect our past and our present and our cultures and stories to future generations. And as Elaine says, we must remember that this too is about justice, that this heritage belongs to us all, and it is who we are. <coughs> University College of London's Institute for Sustainable Heritage describes future heritage in this way. Heritage has a unique relationship to the future. It encompasses society's deliberate efforts to intervene in the society to come, to pass on an inheritance to future generations. This inheritance reflects the values of our time. Heritage is what we care about and what we think future society should have the chance to care about too. And in this way, it is the source of continuity between the society of the past, present and future, underpinning our identity and guiding our aspirations. Thank you. Well, thank you, Katrina. That was a wonderful treatise, really, on what we might consider heritage to be, particularly in relation to uh, Melbourne, but also Adelaide. And I did actually want to s start with that. And there will be an opportunity for um, all of you here to ask some questions of Katrina in a minute. Um, but it's my turn first. Um, and I really want to go back to the Hedrick uh, artwork and that really radical proposition at the Adelaide mm. Festival Centre. And I think... Obviously, that's a, that's, that's a lost piece of heritage. Yes. We didn't make it. That, that didn't survive. Um, and I think heritage is also about remembering things that we've lost. Um, what are your own personal reflections on that work and its loss? And, and if you're up for it, what's replaced it? <laughs> I haven't been there since, since the new plaza has opened. Um, and it's strange. I mean, I, I grew up climbing all over that sculpture. It was sort of a, a part of our lives. And, and early on, it was incredibly well activated. Um, on the festivals that I worked on, we placed um, festival clubs, temporary venues, and, and built them on those spaces and around that sculpture and, and amongst that sculpture. And um, it, it was really wonderful. I actually performed. I had to do a fire act in the 96, 1986 Adelaide Festival. It was absolutely terrifying for the first time ever high up in a concrete sculpture and I was aware of the sharp edges in case I fell. Um, but it is true, I mean, it wasn't maintained. It wasn't cared for, it wasn't preserved in the way that it needed to be. Mm. And so by the time it was sort of suggested that it could go, it looked so terrible and tatty. People had stopped using it. It had kind of become a forgotten part of the, of the um, festival centre. There'd been so many sort of renewal works on the rest of the festival centre with hoardings up and so on for years and years that it, it kind of was a pocket that had been mm. abandoned. So I think the kind of the value of it, the specialness, the uniqueness of that artwork had really been forgotten and that made it easier um, for it to be removed. Um, and, I, and I think that's a real uh, a message 
that we've got to, for those things we really care about, we need to care for them. They don't just arrive and stay. They need to be cared for and preserved and kept alive and reimagined and made relevant. Mm. And I mean, that was the other thing too. They, they, it had no relevance to the contemporary community by the time it was removed and, and that was a terrible shame. Whereas, of course, the buildings, the Morfitt buildings, have been revered and have, and have, have made it through and, and have been, continue to be the sort of anchor for that whole, for that whole precinct. I think it's interesting thinking, thinking about uh, Hedrick and, and Adelaide Festival Plaza in relation to Federation Square, our own, you know, um, masterwork, I guess, is no sort of understatement in, in many ways. And obviously now with that coming under the purview of, of MAP, uh, under MAPCO, and how we make sure that that doesn't happen with Federation Square, how that, because um, I think from, from my perspective, you know, how do we create future heritage? It's probably to do with design quality when it's built, but also to the point you just raised, which is maintaining it, the maintainers. How do we love these things and look after them so that they don't get um, lost along the way? Because even in Federation Square, and I think it's extraordinary for us all to think about this room, for example, one of the great rooms of the town, being 20 years old. It makes us feel old and it makes us feel good because it's such an extraordinary space um, and it was always great to see that in its early days it was always open to the rest of the atrium. It was always conceived of as a sort of continuation. Mm. Um, and there's so many little things in Federation Square that over time have sort of been changed and you touched of course on the, on the um, disastrous Apple um, intervention, although I think that had its positives in the end. Mm. How do, we, how do we make sure we, we don't lose what's great about this unique piece of design that we, we were lucky enough to get? Well, I think, I think the, the big gesture was the people of Melbourne rising up and saying, we love this place, it's important for us, and, and insisting that it be heritage listed. And it really was a, a community-driven mm. uh, movement uh, that got us to that place, and, and it is now protected. I think how we interpret that um, and how we, how we care for that, how we keep this place relevant, how we understand that, of course, things change, uses change and so on, um, is the challenge. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to working with the, with the Fed Square team and, and speaking to a range of... I mean, I've, having been a tenant here, of course, mm. <laughs> for seven and a half years, I have my own opinions from one side of the fence, now I'm in the other side of the fence. And um, it's... it's I think it's really important that we talk um, and listen to a range of different stakeholders, and we're just about to, to embark on that work, um, actually, to, to come up with a new kind of framework that's going to help guide us around the sort of interventions um, and listen to some of the feedback that came up through the, um, both the, the submissions around the heritage listing, but also the Fed Square Review itself. I think there were some pretty clear messages from that. How we interpret that and move forward uh, in coming years from that, I think, is, is a really exciting challenge. And I think, too, placing Fed Square in this kind of broader arts context, I think, is really powerful as well. I think mm. it's a very clever um, way to sort of reinforce yet again this kind of civic and cultural charter. It is, it is a civic space. Um, but it is an arts space and a cultural space. Mm. And I think to connect it so specifically by putting it within this organisation, the Melbourne Arts Precinct Corporation, I think is really helpful in doing that and really thinking very actively about those connections across the river and how they speak to each other and what's special and different about each of those kinds of places and the, the spaces between buildings and how we kind of... Um, activate that in the coming years, I think, is going to be really uh, a really exciting challenge. Well, I think that was so unique about Federation Square is it was conceived as a space between buildings, and I think mm -hmm. that that slight um, suppression in some ways of the identities of the different tenants, and you experienced this at ECNI, was, I think, a, a deliberate intent to foreground the square itself. And whether it's based on an Italian hill town or, or whether it is, it, it was an early attempt to say that that space in between is is the object in a way, yeah. um, and that is, that that reigns supreme. Um, so I, I think I think in, in many ways the uh, the sort of bigness of um, map is is really interesting because it captures all the way to the um, music bowl and beyond, and of course that's going through its own. Um, controversial changes as well at the moment, um, which could be, a, could be the next big debate in Melbourne. Um, but I guess the question I had around the... the and I was surprised when you did show that drawing how big it is. 
and how much residential, super high density residential it includes. I guess the question is, when does a precinct get too big? When does it not be a precinct? And you're increasingly referring to it as a, as a suburb. Mm. Um, so is there, a, is there a risk that a precinct can get too large? Well, I, I don't think so. I mean, you know, I think what's interesting is the kind of density mm. of it. I mean, I, th I think that's what's really exciting and unique about what we have here in Melbourne. It is, uh, you know, it is, I think, the most kind of densely packed corridor of diverse arts activity in a precinct context mm. anywhere. Um, that's hugely exciting. Um, I think cities are going to continue to become more densely populated um, and clearly sustainability is a really important thing that has to be considered through that and, and sustainability is a really important part of the work that we're doing um, on this capital project. Um, but but I, I think that sort of proximity breeds and brings so much kind of opportunity if it's activated effectively. I mean, being being next to each other, <coughs> excuse me, doesn't necessarily mean you'll collaborate, of course. But proximity, um, accidental and spontaneous connections uh, for audiences, for practitioners, for researchers, for students, brings inspiration, it brings conversation, it brings debate. Mm. Um, it, it, it fosters new ideas, it fosters new possibilities, and, and I think that the more... I mean, I, I'm somebody, you know, I come from multi arts festivals, my, I used to be a performer, and, and my work was always multidisciplinary, and I, and I love the opportunity that those sort of different skills and different disciplines bring when they're kind of smushed up against each other, that sort of ensemble approach of creativity with different expertise coming in and feeding and shifting and changing and morphing and ending up with something entirely new. I mean, I, I, I find that really thrilling. And so I, I, I think the kind of potential for that, for the arts precinct, is huge. And I think, I think what we need to make sure is that as the sort of the suburb grows mm. and becomes even more wonderful to be in, it's obviously got rapid growth now, that we're not shutting out the very ingredient that makes it special, and that is the practitioners. Mm. So we've got to have affordable spaces, we've got to have affordable accommodation, we want artists living and working in that precinct. It's not just about the institutions. Which means subsidies, subsidisation. It, it means subsidies. It's also that um, you know, planning amendment, and making sure that mm. those new um, developments are considering that. Um, and I think it's a really important move by Creative Victoria to do that. And, and we won't see the impact of that for a few years, but mm. 10, 15 years from now, we will. Yeah, I, mean, I think that point you raised around how do you not make sure people aren't excluded is, is the key one. Yeah. Because um, and particularly, it seems to me the, 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 the purpose of the project um, broadly is to connect all these things together. A lot of it's already here, only with the exception of NGVC as the new big thing that's coming to town. It's about connective tissue. Yeah. Um, and one of the challenges is obviously, and you discussed it in some detail, the, the elevated nature of the back of um, Roy Grounds' uh, gallery, um, opening that up and effectively expanding that. Mm. And then I guess the challenge then becomes how because you're always deferring the street. How, how do you, you know, you're always going to get there eventually. How do you get back down to the street? And these are challenges for your design team, Indeed. obviously. To, but I think they're the kind of risks. Like, how do you make sure that you don't have this thing that's um, distant in that way and, and not immediately accessible? Because, because, of course, the existing sculpture garden, we were hearing about it the other day at, at an open house event, was um, designated as a, as a sort of a, a, a highly separated space. Mm. And this will be quite an inversion to that totally. whole... Right. But, but when you say it's, it's uh, not at street level, of course it is at street level. It's at secure well, yes, road level. Well, yes, one street, not the... <laughs> that's right. And it's the sloping terrain that is the challenge. Yes, that's right. Uh, so it's how you deal with that slope, isn't yeah. it? And, um, and in this case, it's about extending, extending that, that um, upper level, if you like, that, that uh, bridge level further into the suburb and then finding ways to connect down. Yeah. And yes, it's absolutely the designer's challenge. Um, and that's, you know, again, a group of different designers coming together, um, co-designing, if you like, coming up with the, with the way to make sure that it, it really does connect and it's inviting. I mean, but, you know, having been a tenant, because Acme's had um, Acme X, or most of our staff, that's right, most of their staff, I should say, um, are based in the Australian Ballet Centre. So I've been a resident of that, of, that, of that space for yeah. six years um, in, in that suburb. It's incredibly difficult to get around. 
Mm. I mean, it just is. It's, it's really, oh, yeah, really difficult. I, you, I think we've all ended up on that extension of Sturt Street, just not I, knowing. Where do I go? Or how do I get up there? <laughs> where, and, where's you know, the street? Yeah, I mean, no. everyone likes those kind of sneaky Melbourne ways to get places, but it really is very sneaky. No, too. Um, and, <laughs> and so, you know, I, I, think, I think whatever we do, it is going to be better. I actually met with um, South Bank uh, 3006, so a whole of the residents um, of, of South Bank uh, today, and... Um, we had a big talk about that. Just the challenge of getting around is, is really difficult. And, and, you know, a lot of it's about safety yeah. as well, pedestrian safety. I mean, if, if, if I get off at Flinders Street Station and I want to go down and meet somebody who's coming out of, you know, the Melbourne Recital Centre after a fabulous concert and have a drink there on the street, how do I get there? Mm. Well, I'm certainly not going to walk through those back streets right now. No. <laughs> you know? no, so how do we make it safe and feel vibrant and feel like a really kind of activated place night and day? Um, and that's not about, you know creating this kind of crazy hubbub, it's just creating a suburb that's alive and connected. And, you know, from working in festivals, I think what's so exciting, what, you know, when you know something is really singing, it's when you've got people who don't normally come along mm. to suddenly go, I'm going to give this a try, mm. and then to hang around and talk about it. Mm. And the conversation that then comes from that, that's fostered from that, is kind of what changes things. Mm. Um, and that's about social spaces, that's the spaces in between that we've mm. really got to kind of make sure benefit from this investment. So would, all that wonderful looking green space, is, is the intention that that is like a parkland, it's open all the time and you can just yep. wander up there any time yep. of night, that's right. which I think is critical to its success, like, totally. like Federation, Federation Square itself. And you touched a bit on the integration of Green Line, which is a very exciting City of Melbourne led project. Um, that's weaving really through um, the Melbourne Arts Precinct. Um, and there's obviously lots of opportunities there as well. Um, yes. How do you think that will play out in terms of, in terms of those relationships and those connections? Because I think one of the things Green Line's doing very well is setting up its, its First Nations relationships incredibly well. Mm -hmm. That's obviously something you're also seeking to do. That's right. That's right. And yeah, and I think, again, I mean, a project of this scale and size with the kind of you know, incredibly broad remit that we've got as well, which is not just the building project, but mm. trying to leverage the benefit is all about partnerships, all about collaboration, all about kind of connection and, and trying to leverage all of the things that are being done. I mean, there's, this is, you know, we're looking after one chunk of money in one particular area, but this triggers a whole lot of investment and activation, much of which is already on its way. Mm. And how do we make sure that that glue is glued together and it's speaking to each other? And I've been having uh, really great conversations for City of Melbourne so far. I'm only three months in, but yeah. you know. <laughs> I wanted to just briefly mention before we open it up for questions, so start thinking of your questions. A few years ago, uh, Rem Coolhouse speculated on, um, on this in, in relation to the, the concepts of contemporary heritage and, and the idea that it was sort of catching up with us that um, projects would get more and more recently heritage listed. It was very interesting to hear how quickly the grounds projects got heritage mm. listed. Quicker than I thought, actually. And obviously, 20, uh, a bit under 20 years for Federation Square here. And Cool House, in his sort of normal Cool house sort of a way, was speculating that you could end up with a situation where projects might be heritage listed before they're finished. Um, you know, do, you think, do you think there's any risk, you know, in terms of this idea of future heritage, that heritage could be too restrictive, like the, you know, you might have a situation where you aren't able to change and and do the things you need to do as things begin to settle in and and, and uses change. Yeah, I think so, and I mean, I think there's a, a, a cliche around what heritage means and what heritage listing means, and it's it's a cliche because sometimes it's true. Um, you know, oh no, it's heritage listed now. I can't do anything, and it's going to cost me a fortune, and so on and so forth, and you know. Sure, but I mean, a progressive view of heritage, which I think is what we're talking about here, mm. is, is, is one where this is a lived, magnificent space that is relevant in the past, that is relevant now, how do we keep it engaged and preserved and cared for and ready to gift to the future? Um, so I think, and I, and I think that notion too of heritage when we think about it being many kinds of heritage and that they all speak and interconnect with each other is again uh, a way to kind of demystify or um, deconstruct the idea, that's funny, deconstruct the idea of heritage, getting away from this kind of a, a cliched and sort of stereotypical approach. Mm. Um, it, it needs to be, it needs to, things can't stay the same and they don't stay the same. 
Mm. And that's important because human beings don't and society doesn't. And, you know, you think of the change in values. You think of the, 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 what we now think is important as Victoria's going into treaty, of, you know, what's been happening in Gama, you know, mm. over the weekend. I mean, you know, unthinkable, unthinkable, <laughs> unthinkable six months ago, actually. But, um, you know, like, it, with that changing and that evolution and hopefully... It's idealistic, things could get much worse as we're seeing in Ukraine. Um, but with, with that evolving, changing kind of world, of course things need to shift mm. and functions need to shift with the people who are using them as, as their behaviour is different and their needs are different. Um, and I think it's about finding an appropriate balance. Yeah, I think progressive heritage is a, is a good term for it because I think often when we think about heritage or we, we can see, a, we can see a, a very staid view of what that might be and an idea of one that's purely about the past um, but as these more interesting definitions of heritage that you've touched on would suggest, it is actually about, to some extent, the future. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that we are also referring to a former value system when we look at heritage. In fact, interestingly, last night at the Design Building on Country event, the capital, we were hearing about really the, the need to sort of begin to rethink the idea of uh, Indigenous heritage and sort of, you know, sort of post-invasion um, architectural heritage is, is a separate things. Mm. Um, and I think that was a very sort of instructive way of beginning to reframe how we see it, as well as also something you touched on, this idea of layering as mm. key to, to heritage, mm. um, that everything is sort of exists there. Um, I am going to open it up to questions. Um, I think we've got a couple of roaming mics. Um, I think I see Helen at the back there, potentially. Uh, Jeff has got one at the front here. Jeffrey, do you want to... Um, can we get a mic down to Jeff? Thanks. And now we've got one there. Sorry, I didn't see you there with the light. Yes, well, let's do, let's do the gentleman here first. Sorry. Thanks, Pierre. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Katrina. Congratulations for your appointment. Thank you. um, my name's Mark Johnson. I'm the chairman and director of the Australian National Veterans Arts Museum, or ANVAM, and a great pleasure in hosting one of the very first uh, Open House Melbourne events yesterday, which was a public art trail from Denny, um, Victoria Barracks uh, all the way through this precinct and on, on up to the State Library and we encountered something like, pardon me, 40 odd veteran artists and architects and patrons in that journey, many of whom who uh, you've mentioned tonight, Jeff Kennett, largely responsible for this, Rupert Hamer, uh, Roy Grounds, uh, Myers, so uh, um, Ken and Bales Meyer, both responsible as patrons for the Meyer Music Bowl. Um, you mentioned the VCA, Lenton Parr, an Air Force veteran, was the first director there 50 years ago in its centenary. So that's a bit of the context. Um, part of our journey has been to try and establish a, a uh, home for veterans' arts, which is our thing, and many other communities have their own uh, purpose um, or focus. Our purpose is around well-being. So we are trying to establish our home within a place that is important and was built for the heritage, uh, sorry, the veteran community down near Victoria Barracks uh, in the 30s and it still survives today. So I'm very interested, I don't think I heard you mention well-being, but our purpose mm -hmm. is well-being and the heritage of that place for the future um, well-being of the veteran community and the broader community of South Bank and beyond is important. So I'd be very interested to get your context or insights in terms of heritage and well-being. Mm, mm. Thank you. Yeah, that's such a such an important point, and that that sense of well-being, which comes from connection, um, which comes from care and and preservation and respect, and also possibility and opportunity, um, and and what that means as kind of uh, coming together as a kind of society amongst those. Um, amongst all these kind of different art forms and amongst, you know, if, we, if we're prioritising invitation and access uh, to make sure that people right across the community are invited in to be a part and to make it theirs, to contribute to the heritage. I mean, I think that's the point I was trying to make at the beginning too, that, that sense that, you know, the buildings and the collections that we hold and the kind of stories that we hold within a museum are about those many, many people who've contributed that, who've told those stories, who've shared them, who've interpreted them, who've discussed them, and that, I think, is absolutely intrinsic to well-being. 
I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I'm agreeing with you that it's a hugely important thing to factor in, I think a huge benefit out of, um, out of all of the investment and the work that's been done for so long and into the future. Thank you. Uh, Jeffrey Robinson, do you have a question still over here? And then I think we've got a few up the, in the tiered seating. Thanks very much, and Katrina, fantastic presentation, and congratulations on your appointment. And it's wonderful to see that there will be a person with overall responsibility for that such a wide area in the um, Melbourne precinct. Um, I've been living in Melbourne for 23 years, and I'm a member of the Heritage Council, and it's a city I love. And um, one of the things that you spoke about was in, in considering the new uh, NGVC, um, but also I think in the wider precinct is this aspect of sustainability. Mm. And I think my question is really around, um, there's obviously a number of interventions going to happen with the NGVC and I've sort of seen the beautiful pictures that you showed and so on. Um, the whole of the precinct though is going to be challenged by the changes in our climate. You mentioned mm. the fact that things will change and we need to adapt to those things. And I suppose i just like your thoughts on, because it's a whole precinct and because it's about people coming together, what are your thoughts on how we might have to look at the whole of the precincts with a kind of a holistic sustainability strategy, mm. a kind of an overall water strategy, a thinking about comfort, about what it's like, going to be like to be outside when unfortunately we're going to have long periods of time where it's going to be quite hot. Mm. I think that offers amazing opportunities mm. to think about a much greener Melbourne, uh, a more carefully considered shading Melbourne, etc. But that's mm. just my ideas. I'd be mm. interested in yours. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Um, I mean, one of the great things that, again, this this um, capital project offers the sort of the, the precinct that we're spending money in is the opportunity to have a really strong sustainability agenda. You know, um, uh, Hassel's been describing as the aim, aim for zero agenda. And obviously with a new building like NGVC, you've got wonderful opportunity to sort of bring in best practice in terms of water, waste um, and energy. But, but it also offers us the chance to kind of consolidate services and do some quite um, progressive things that are going to start to improve these older uh, buildings that hadn't considered those things quite as um, carefully um, as, as we are now. So, so that's really exciting um, and we're going to see really significant improvement that will then continue to be built on over time. Um, in terms of the sort of the planting design, um, Hassel and Soil um, uh, are really working um, on developing a, a kind of planting design that is considering climate change and what we're going to see in terms of the you know, really significant shift in climate uh, in, in Melbourne, what that means for planting um, you know, in terms of local plants, indigenous plants, as well as introduced plants and what are the kind of combinations to create a garden that you know, really is designed to be something that is very green, very beautiful, that's always changing throughout every kind of season. Um, and so that's a kind of really interesting journey that I think we'll all be on over the next few years as they start to kind of research and explore what, what that could be. In terms of the sort of broader precinct, I think there's absolutely real opportunity and, and I think that's hugely exciting as we take a kind of holistic view of the precinct. You know, what are the things that can link up? What is a very broad range and quite disparate range of things mm. in the built form and in what they do? Um, and to me, I mean, the, the obvious things are obviously, you know, wayfinding, both, both physical and digital. Lighting, I think, is hugely important. And planting, um, you know, the city of Melbourne is, is really... Uh, excited and, and committed to a greener city and I think that that's going to be really interesting to talk with them and just see what can be kind of mapped out on the other side of the river um, over the next kind of 5, 10, 20 years to make sure that, that there is a kind of a language, I suppose, and a connection through through planting, lighting and so on that, that give a sense of cohesion but also cool it down. I might take another... I think, I think, I think there's a question... At least one around there. Yes, thanks, Piera. Interestingly, just on sustainability, um, I think one of the interesting things we didn't um, touch on tonight is that sustainability and heritage are sort of merging as concerns as well. Mm -hmm. You know, they're often completely separate fields. 
uh, particularly through building reuse, are now being seen increasingly together, which I think is a good thing. Do we have our questioner? Yep. Hi. My name is Margaret Bertley. Katrina, thanks for your address. It was very stimulating and informative. I'm over here. Can't um, see. Oh, there you are. Yes, it's hard could, to see. Sorry, could the lights be brought up in the house, <laughs> oh, do yes. you think? Oh, yes. House lights is an excellent idea. <laughs> maybe, maybe it'll happen. Anyway. <laughs> Thanks, Katrina, for mentioning heritage collections in your talk and the importance of movable cultural heritage as, as well as built heritage. Uh, there's one collection that you didn't mention which is really central to the precinct. It lives at the Arts Centre. It's the Arts Centre's heritage collections and they comprise both the artworks and the very important performing arts collections. The performing arts collections used to have a dedicated home known as the Performing Arts Museum. That changed several decades ago and access to those collections is now problematic, ad hoc, changeable. I wonder whether your work with the precinct is going to give an opportunity for the Victorian Arts Centre heritage collections to have more profile and perhaps a new home. Mm. Thank yeah. you. Um, yes, you're right, and, and referring to collections, I definitely um, uh, want to uh, include those uh, inside the theatre's buildings, um, and the Music Vault has been such a terrific, uh, small but very, very effective um, intervention um, in, in recent times. Look, I mean, I can't speak for Arts Centre Melbourne in relation to that, but it is something that is a big priority for them, I know. Um, it is an extraordinary collection, the Performing Arts Collection, um, and they've had some immensely successful and important exhibitions um, uh, over the years, and, and I know it's a priority for them, and we'll certainly work with them however we can to support that vision um, into the future. I think another question nearby there. Thanks, Pierre. Hi, Katrina. Hi, Katrina. I'm a Master of Architecture student. And um, my question is regarding to the art precinct. I'm wondering why Nicolas Building is excluded from the art precinct, and it's just um, at the edge of the boundary line. Yeah. And I'm wondering, in the art precinct, are there any working space for the artists? Mm -hmm. And I see there are lots of exhibitions, um, which cr um, create opportunity for the public to engage with the artwork. However, m do you think the artwork might be a bit isolated from the artists? And I'm wondering if arts, art pressing can create any opportunities for public realm to engage in the um, art um, making progress. Mm. There's four questions there, but the, <laughs> the, uh, we'll see if you can treat it. But the Nicholas Building one's particularly interesting. Yeah, I mean, I th that's... Um, Yes, yeah, so it's weird. So there's this kind of line that's Flinders Street, and then there's a huge amount of creative and cultural activity on the other side of that line. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think, uh, again, we talk about how big it can get. <laughs> Let's make it bigger. How big can it get? The, look, I, I mean, the Nicholas Building is so important, mm. and um, I think there has to be connections, and how we do that, I'm not sure. I mean, we've, this is what we've got to develop over the next few years together uh, to work out the best possible way. I mean, even if it's simply through um, kind of more collaboration, through kind of digital platforms and um, connections so that, so that the public can navigate in and through the, the sort of breadth of content easily and seamlessly, um, you know, I think that would be a huge step forward, but I, I think that's probably the minimum. On that, um, on that particular issue, the Nicholas Building, it, I think ultimately the project seeks to effectively provide space for those types of practitioners. Yeah, and, and, a, and the and Nicholas a, Building will probably get, you know, it, it'll, it'll probably not be the Nicholas Building in the way we know it forever. Mm. So, I mean, I'm assuming that there's an idea that you, and to, to the, another question there around providing spaces for those practitioners within the precinct. Yeah, yeah, and, and again, I mean, I think that's why that um, building amendment is so important, because that's exactly mm. what mm. that's about. Uh, there's already some sort of co-working space and studio space available um, in the precinct, and obviously a huge amount within the university campus, but um, we need more, and again, how that will kind of appear, I think, is going to be uh, through a range of different levers, um, including particularly this amendment. In the interest of uh, time and equity, I might just see if there's one more question floating out there from another questioner. 
Do we have any others? Down at the front here, and this will be the last question. Unless you've got a particularly good question and you insist on asking it. Thanks, Katrina. <laughs> um, you mentioned Rising as one of a great example of um, a festival and that activates space, and I think festivals do provide that great opportunity to really activate the, the in-between spaces, the not the mm -hmm. buildings necessarily. And so I was just wondering if there'd been any consideration, particularly in the public realm around the um, NGBC, for both in the design and in kind of partnerships with festivals and how you might look to activate that space beyond just it being a, a, a place for public to, to walk through and, mm -hmm. and dwell in. Yeah, so we're, we're working on that at the moment. And I've actually just met with last week with the festivals group. Um, which includes all of the kind of um, sort of state-funded festivals, I suppose. Um, and uh, we're talking about exactly that. What are the kind of the ways to, to activate? What are the ways we can improve um, opportunities for festivals to get into those sort of spaces between? It's, it's tricky finding the gaps at the moment. So, so how do we do that? I mean, I think... Um, also, we're talking a lot with NGB and Arts Centre Melbourne and, and the stakeholders more broadly around what does it mean with this new green space? What does that do that's different to what my Music Bowl does and what Fed Square does and, and what does this new space enable? Um, and I think that's really interesting too um, in terms of the sort of potential for new kinds of work. Um, and of course, you know, with the arrival of 5G and 6G, goodness knows what's going to be possible and what people are going to be doing as well um, in that kind of digital space too. So, um, yes, those conversations are absolutely critical. Thank you. Um, I'm going to draw formalities to a close in a minute, but I've got a few thank yous to do first, so uh, bear with me. First of all, let's thank Katrina Sedgwick for a fantastic heritage address. Thank you, Katrina. Thank you very much. Um, and Katrina's address and previous addresses um, will be, all, the previous ones are already available on the Open House uh, Melbourne website, as will uh, Katrina's if you want to go back and look at it. I'd also like to thank, of course, Heritage Council Victoria, long standing partners in this uh, project and with Open House Melbourne. But I'd also like to take this as president of Open House Melbourne, um, which is a largely ceremonial role, to thank the people who actually do all the work of Open House Melbourne led, of course, by Fleur Watson. So if we could all thank Fleur Watson for putting together... <laughs> for putting together what has, already, what has been an extraordinarily successful weekend, aided slightly by the weather yesterday, but um, it has been a remarkable return to the city uh, for Open House Melbourne, and hopefully all of you here have been able to get around some of those 200 um, things, as I call them, open buildings, talks, events, exhibitions. It's been beautifully overwhelming to get to, I don't know, maybe 10% of it over the last two days, including uh, this as one of four nighttime events that we've had, um, starting on Thursday night with the screening of Modern Melbourne, uh, this year focused on the work of Peter Elliott. That also will be available on Open House Melbourne website. Uh, that was a fantastic sort of soft kickoff, and then we had a remarkable um, opening. Uh, this is pub formal opening. This is public, um, and that of course was at Acme on uh, Thursday night. And then we had a remarkable uh, this is public event, a smorgasbord of incredibly um, interesting work uh, dealing with difficult subject areas on uh, on Friday night at the Capitol Theatre, and then last night a, a wonderful uh, First Nations event designed on country, which I alluded to. Uh, tonight, also at um, the Capitol, and of course finishing here very appropriately at Federation Square. So it's been a really great uh, event, um, particularly from my perspective. I'd also like to thank the team at Open House Melbourne who work with Fleur. That's, uh, of course, Helen, Is, Pierre and Lucy, and of course the 400 volunteers who help put together Open House uh, Melbourne and we see on the streets. It's a great um, effort. So let's also thank that wonderful group of volunteers and the staff at Open House Melbourne. So I think I'd also just like to, like to thank Fed Square um, for hosting us here very appropriately. And if we don't have any further business, I'd also like to thank, of course, Professor Philip Goad, 
Um, that draws the, uh, both this evening and the Open House weekend to a close. Remember, Open House Melbourne is a year-long program. There are many things. They all end up on the website eventually. But check out our future events coming over the next 12 months. So thank you again, and thanks, Katrina, again. Thanks. Thanks to